Hello, everyone. I'm Heather Downing, or Coraline, on Twitter, and I'm here with my esteemed associate, Matt Ravel, who is also M. Ravel on Twitter. And we're going to talk today about what, Matt? We're going to be talking about J Hipster. J Hipster stands for Java Hipster, or that was the original definition. Java Hipster. Okay. Uh, now, Full disclosure, uh, I, I did touch Java like maybe 10 years ago, like back when Android was really like getting started a little bit more. And I quickly retreated back to C Sharp where I belong. So you're going to have to give me, first of all, what problem did you see desperately needed solving in, in order for you to come up with this idea? So first of all, it's not my idea. The fact that I even look like the uh, mascot was purely coincidence. Or not really a coincidence because I chose that. So I found the project in, I think it was 2013, maybe 2014, somewhere around there. And I was working for a client that was like, hey, we'd like an Angular and REST prototype. And I basically found J Hipster and was able to create one in under a day. So I was, I was really happy with that. And, uh, and, you know, it was originally developed to just make it easy for you to use Spring Boot or not even Spring Boot, it was Spring and Angular on the front end. And at the time it was AngularJS. So Angular 2 hadn't even been come out, hadn't been announced or anything like that. And so it just combined like all of these things together. And that's why they called it Hipster was because it was the latest and greatest. Now, the interesting thing is it was invented by Julien Dubois in France. And in France, their Hipster definition is a little bit different than ours. Ours is someone who like defies the mainstream, right? In the US. and and does things differently. Well, in France, it was someone who embraces the latest and greatest kind of stuff. So a little bit of disconnect there, but that was the idea is, hey, you're a Java developer, you wanna do front end stuff, and you don't really wanna learn how to do it as much, you kinda just want it generated for you. So that's where the Angular angle came on from that. And since then, you know, it's been five, six years and it's really grown as a project. That's awesome. So the reason that I decided to ask you about this today is because it's like slowly started to kind of infiltrate other languages as well. Right. Uh, and, and now I'm just hearing it all the time naturally because you worked on the project too, but um, I didn't really pay a lot of attention to like Java based, you know, uh, projects obviously, but now I understand there's like a .NET one. So tell me about this. So we have a concept called blueprints that is probably about three years old. And the whole idea of it is you can write a blueprint, it's hard for me to say, um, that overrides the default behavior. So the default behavior is like Spring Boot on the back end, um, Angular or React on the front end. And our next version will have Vue as well. But if you want to use a different framework or language on the back end, you would use a blueprint to do that. So it's still all like NPM based. Um, but someone has written a .NET Core blueprint that you can install. And when you generate a JHipster app, it'll use .NET Core instead of Spring Boot. Same thing for there's a Node.js version. There's even Quarkus and Micronaut. So if you don't like Spring Boot for some reason, you can use those as well. So um, those have really blossomed. And it's helped us because there's been people that write those that aren't part of the core team. And it's allowed us to really grow as a team and an ecosystem. So they're pretty cool. And I started writing one for Ionic, but what I found was that you actually wouldn't want to, I don't think, replace the whole front end in a JHipster app with Ionic. You'd probably want it as a separate app, a separate mobile app. So I ended up creating a module instead. And a module is different from a blueprint because you're not overriding any default behavior. You're just like creating something new. And so that's why I did it that way. Wow, so it actually sounds like it has become the candy land game of like stops along the way to become what it is, right? Right, right, and it, it's largely because I've talked to so many people that are like, it seems that if I could get Elastic Search in there or something like that, that that would be good for marketing, right? And so for me, I started Okta in 2017, and I remember having an epiphany like that April. So I started in February, and in April I was like, if I just make J Hipster the thing I talk about when I talk about Okta, I can work on J Hipster, I can improve it, and I can do my job, right? And so that's why I invested a lot early so I could go around the world and talk about J Hipster and it would just be my job because it uses Okta or works with Okta. Oh, that's pretty cool. So um, 
is it an all-in-one solution? Is this something where you have to download it? Like, is it, does it have its own site? Maybe we can go to the site. Like what would people see if they went to, is it a GitHub repo or does it have its own like big site around it? So I can share my screen if you want to pipe that in. Yes. And so if you go to the website, um, it originally said like jhipster is a good way to do like Spring Boot and Angular applications. But what happened was so many other companies were investing in it that we changed to the tagline of jhipster is a development platform to quickly generate, develop, and deploy modern web applications and microservice architectures. And part of the reason for that, I mean, full of buzzwords, right? But if you think that one's good, we got one way down here that's even more. So this is the... Uh, this is the one with all the buzzwords, right? Angular, React, Vue, Micronaut, Corcus, Node.js. If you want to deploy to AWS, Azure, Cloud Foundry, Google Cloud, Heroku, like we support all that. And then we have all these examples down here. So it kind of has become that, not by intention, but I think because the blueprints and the modules and the way it's extensible that we've just added all these options. And so we do, we do struggle with, you know, is there too many options? Um, but that's where the blueprints come in because by default people won't use those. They'll just use the regular thing. So I can also um, point people to there's a video that I created here. Um, but I can just go and do a, a quick demo of this as well. So this is a screen cache that shows how to use jhipster 6, which is the current version. And uh, we're up to like Spring Boot 2, 3, I think, and Angular 10. But uh, just to show you what it looks like, I'll create a, a brand new app just real quickly. So I'm not in my home directory. OK, so start in your home directory. One of the biggest mistakes that people make is they will type like jhipster right here. And what will happen, it's, it's based on Yeoman. And uh, this is what Yeoman does. It puts everything in your, uh, your home directory, right? Puts it in your current directory. So this is not a great thing to do because there's a bunch of small files that get created in there. Um, you know, dot files and stuff like that. So I usually do like take jhipster. That just is a shortcut for doing make dir and cd into there. And so once you're there, you can type jhipster. And it'll basically prompt you for all these different questions. So what type of application would you like to create? A monolithic one, microservice, a microservice gateway, or a jhipster UAA. I'll just do a simple monolith. Um, you can make it reactive with Spring Web Flux. I'll just choose the default and say no. Um, the base name, we'll just do jhipster. Um, default package name is fine. jhipster registry, you can use that for a microservices architecture to like, you know, make your services talk to each other. Um, type of authentication, um, I'll do OAuth because I like it and I wrote it. Um, SQL, we'll just use that for the uh, database. And then Postgres or Mariah or Oracle for your production one. So you typically have like an H2 database, which is in memory or on disk just for local development and then production is, uh, as you know, a uh, more robust database. And then uh, development database, some caching stuff. I'll just choose the defaults, Maven or Gradle, go with Maven, and then there's some other options. But basically you can see there's a whole lot of options here, right? Angular, React, and Vue. The reason you see Vue in there is because I'm actually using, even though it says 6.10.5 is a version, I'm using a uh, seven development branch. And so then you can choose a boot swatch theme and uh, internationalization. I'll just choose English. And uh, let's do another one here. How about Chinese? And uh, you can do testing with Protractor, Cucumber, or Cypress. Um, I'll just leave those off for now. And then we also have a jhipster marketplace. That's where those modules are. So if I clicked or typed in yes here, it would give me all kinds of other options. So I'll just choose the default. And then it'll go and generate all these files for me, right? Java on the back end. Um, I chose Angular, so Angular on the front end, and that's how it all works. So that takes um, a couple minutes, right, to develop all that. And so uh, when when that's finished, I can I can go back to it, or we can. Uh, another thing I like to do is just show people like the code. But if you have any questions, like now is a good time. I have so many questions. Okay, so does it? Do you have to install a command line? This, is that the only way it can be installed? Is this a NuGet package? Is it on npm? Like, how does it work? Right. So, um, great question. So, how you would install it is if I uh, open up a new terminal. Um, the easiest way is just npm i dash g generator jhipster. Right. Okay. So that's 
that's the more traditional way to get started. Um, we have an online, so if you're familiar with like start.spring.io or other online, we have start.jhipster.tech. Missing the T. Oh yeah, this is why I like pair programming. Yes, the best. If, if you're doing a screencast, you're like, ah, I gotta edit that out. So <laughs> with, uh, with jhipster online, you can, uh, you can sign in. I already have an account, but you know, you don't need one. Um, you can do it without this. The reason you do this is so you have um, various uh, application definitions that you can use. I'm not sure why that didn't work. Let me try again. And we're able to sign in. Not someone broke something recently, so <laughs> they should be able to sign in. But if you go to JDL Studio, so well, let's debug this. We got time, right? Yes. So maybe just create a new account. That would be easier. Wait, I see you on there now. What's that? One. I, now it looks like I, I saw your other account there. There, was, there wasn't two before. So this one, right? Weird. Yeah, I don't see it on, the, on that. Oh, yeah, see, look, there's two there. I don't have the username. That's probably what I'm missing. I mean, it should give me an error, right, if it doesn't work. I know they just updated this recently, so let's try registering for a new one. We'll go ahead and say uh, mrabel, or try a different one, matt.rabel. Um, do Okta, and we'll use that suggested password. Now everyone knows that's not going to be good, huh? <laughs> uh, um, we'll create a new one. Call it jhipster online. Yeah. And then create my account. Okay, so we should be able to sign in with this one now. Nope, oh, someone broke something. So if you go through here, just like that wizard I showed you in the browser, where mm -hmm. or uh, from the command line, where it gives you those choices, the same thing happens here. So um, if you go to start.jhipster.tech, you have an account, then you can do that. And so. Um, People like that because one of the things you can do is actually push it right to GitHub. And so oh, if you can put cool. it to GitHub, you could actually go to Heroku and configure Heroku to pull from GitHub and you would never even need to put it on your local machine, right? So that makes for a pretty cool demo. Um, the other cool thing is this JDL Studio. What this allows you to do is define your actual uh, application with code. So this application configuration right here, you say what the name is, whether it's reactive, and what you're really doing is overriding the default. So if you don't have authentication type OAuth 2 here, you'll mm -hmm. have JWT by default. Oh, this is really cool. I like the way that it shows everything all laid out. Right, so you can kind of see the relationship, right, and all that. And so, you know, if I was to take this one, this has, for instance, a gateway that's reactive, and then it uses Neo4j, it uses Protractor for testing. And this service discovery is you needed. You can use Eureka or console. And then it's got like a blog application that uses Couchbase, right? They all have to use the same authentication type, which in a microservices architecture is either JWT or OAuth2. And then here we have a store that uses Mongo. Wow. And then you define the relationships between your entities. So you can see we have entities up here that says, you know, all the entities are on the front end. Right, because that's where we want them to, you know, talk to the back end. And then the back end, this one has blog and post and tag. And this one just has a simple product entity. And then you can create relationships between them. So you define them like this, just the property name, the type, validation rules, you know, required, minimum length, stuff like that. And then you define your relationships down here. And it generates all the code that's needed for that to work on a UI. So if I was to take this one. You know, you can either copy and paste it like that, or you can download it with this button over here. Um, I'll just download it. It creates this jhipster JDL file, and that that basically matches what you see right in this screen, right? If we were to open it in, I don't know, TextMate or something. And you would see it's just that same code. Okay, so... Right? But the coolest thing with this is then you can go and create your whole app using that. So, so was, at its core, so jhipster is like um, a build your own template generator. 
Right. You have all number of options, right? For your database, for your UI, for your back end. Traditionally, the back end didn't have that many options because it was just like, you know, a monolith or a microservice or maybe a gateway for your microservices, but it was all Spring Boot, right? And mm. there was some options in there, like if you want a service class in your web class. So you have a web class that like serves up your JSON API, but do you want to have a service class that's between that and like your repositories or not, right? There's, there's weird choices like that in there and I rarely use them, but I think a lot of people do. Well, so I'm already envisioning like the next three steps, which I'm sure you've thought about before when it comes to extensibility of this. I'm going to ask you questions like, is there an API that can eventually get me to the point where it will generate all that stuff for me? Um, and Or it has to be installed locally in order for me to do it? Like, how, how does it work? Well, I wish I could show you this start.jhipster.tech because it has, you know, that the web browser based version of how you can create the application. But um, let's look at the blueprints. So J hipster blueprints. So this is what gives you that ability to override, um, you know, the defaults. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the API, like the Kotlin blueprint replaces most of the server side code. Um, sample blueprint shows how a client can be overridden. And then if we were to look at like J hipster dot net core, If we were to go into here, so it has all the code, right? It shows you how to install it. So you would install npm install like this, and then mm. you could update it like this. And then what you do is when you run jhipster, you do dash dash blueprints. So if you wanted to look at like the files that this creates, we could go into it's probably in generators here. Um, maybe look at the server. There's there's many different points. So there's the app, right? This is what's going to generate the actual app for you but then all the files are either going to be like on the client or the server. And so we do support generating like CRUD, right? With those entities that you saw earlier. So if we were to look at like an entity server, it would show what an entity's templates might look like. So let's see like controllers here. This is what a uh, looks like a, a test would look like. So these are, these are JavaScript functions. Everything's written in JavaScript, but then, you know, like the .NET code is in here. Mm. Right, That's and so it's kind of difficult to read, but um, there is, this is called EJS. I think it's uh, ECMAScript something template or whatever. And uh, well, we can find out, right? EJS is embedded JavaScript templates. So oh, that's cool. you could get like a plugin for VS Code or for IntelliJ or whatever that would make this look, you know, like you'd want it to look with your syntax highlighting. But if we looked at, you know, the source, like we could see how, a project might look. Um, I'm not sure, like what the defaults would be, because I'm not that yeah, familiar with that. Yeah. But here's like the main services class kind of thing. Oh, so it just replaces a nice. That's right. pretty cool. So, like, uh, the reason I was asking about whether or not there's an API that will, like, uh, generate some of this, like, with without even obviously there is, because you have, um, at least locally, you can, you know. Ask, answer all the questions, which I love because it's done in a human way. Like, hey, where are you going to host your database? What are you going to do with this? Right. I mean, in my next, you know, step towards the future, I want to be able to just command my computer to do things with my voice. So I'm like, please tell me I can say like, Alexa, tell Jay Hipster that I want an app, a .NET app that is this and that in the background and just have her ask the questions and then me answer. Right. And I'll feel very Tony Stark about it. Yes, uh, this back end or this front, you know, like that would be awesome. And it seems like you've already kind of gotten like 80% of the way to what I've imagined always. That's pretty awesome. Right. And, and I've thought of that too, because it would make for a great demo, right? Maybe not real world, but. Uh, Why not? J well, JHipster is originally based on Yeoman, right? Mm. And the command for Yeoman is Yo, right? So I'd always make a joke that Yo, JHipster, create me an app, right? And that would be like so cool if you could do that to your Alexa device or your Google Home or whatnot. And then I it would can. you, right? I, I don't think it would be terribly difficult, right? And it could probably I have, use, Yeah, I've done uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of voice stuff. Like the real question is does start.jhipster.tech like support something like that, right? So if you were to use HTTP5 and go start.jhipster. 
at tech. Right? Like now it's just an HTML page versus if you do like, you know, HTTP start at spring.io, they actually prompt you, right? And say, hey, here's a way to do it. Yeah. Right? And we even have, I don't know if you knew this, but is it Akka.dev? So there's that one too that you can create, you know, new orgs with our API. Yes, I did know that. Um, but I, I think it would be cool. Like either way, I mean, obviously I'm kind of a bleeding edge nerd and I like that stuff. But I, the more I thought about it, you know, everything is about removing friction in what we're doing, right? And yep. like, even though it sounds, oh, the, it's just fun. You're not going to do that all all the time. Why not? Like there are there are people that have harder time typing and it would be easier if yeah. things were automated. Cause that's pretty much what we're doing anyway with like our keyboard shortcuts inside of our IDE there. I mean, I don't think it's crazy. Um, it's starting to take up. So for me, it's more about looking like a magician and <laughs> just yeah. <laughs> speaking things into existence, but I love that you can do this. So when it comes to, I don't know, is this considered a fork of the jhipster.net core fork or is it considered a, it's, it's a blueprint, which is like, an additional so blueprint, which just overrides that uh, that default behavior on the back end. Okay, uh, so if anything changes in the core project, uh, not in .NET Core, but in the actual just core J Hipster project, does that break all of the blueprints, or and they have to go in and manually update, or not? It's a it's a delicate thing. Um, what we have, I believe, is that in here they define what version they work with, and then if it's not using that latest version, then it fails. Right, so so I do believe you do have to have some version alignment with your J Hipster install and your Blueprint install. Uh. And and you know my like this one, uh, I think they're working on it. Blazor as the front end is being developed. Which Blazor? <laughs> .NET Blazor, right? No, yeah, but which Blazor? There's um there's two. So there's Blazor. This called Blazor Server Side and Blazor. Awesome, but they both can be the front end. I know that sounds a little weird um, because one of them is, it's it's a long story. Um, then there's also like, hey, is it a .NET Core hosted um, Blazor app or is it hosted separately? So there's lots of like question marks about which version when people say Blazor you mean, which is why we'll have never ending content to talk about in the .NET world. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, you can see this hasn't been updated in a while, so. I don't know if there's any files we could look at that might do it, but my guess would be it's a, it's a front end, whatever front end version. And what we try to do with JHipster is we try not to be too fancy, right? So if, if we have Spring Boot, we're just gonna use like most of Spring Boot's defaults. So if we find a bug where we wanna do something different, maybe we'll override that. But I would say in the Blazor sense, we would take the default recommendation and implement that. We wouldn't try to get fancy if there's no demand for it. And that's another thing that happens a lot because we have so many options. Every time we do a major release, we look at actually dropping things because mm -hmm. there's no maintainer for it. We have, you know, there's like 20 people that maintain the project. There's probably another, you know, 10 or 15 that work on the blueprints. But what we've seen over the years is there's been burnout for many people um, because they've done so much work on the project and it affects their family lives and stuff like that. So we're constantly getting like new groups of people that kind of step up and do the work. It's the nature of open source. Um, but you know, we don't, we've been done a pretty good job about not having like the original contributors kill themselves trying to keep people happy, you know? No, oh, for sure. So what about CICD? Like, is there anything that JHipster can do? Like for that, is it difficult to integrate? Yep. So JHipster CICD, we have a, what we call a generator for that. And so you can see um, we have Jenkins, Travis, GitLab, Azure, GitHub Actions, and Circle CI. Nice. So um, we created this project over here, right? And it's up and running now. So I can just do a quick demo what that looks like. Well, it looks like something in the translation's messed up. That's what you get for using the master branch, right? Or it's actually, we're good about that. We don't call it master anymore. We renamed it to main. Um, so we're not doing that, but you know this might be tough to demo if uh, things aren't working. So it uses Key Cloak by default, which runs in a Docker container, and uh, I just must have messed up my choices somehow there. But uh, but we can go back and look at actually implementing CI/CD on this. So I wonder if 
your port is just different when you set this up. No, it's because I'm using the main branch. I knew it was a risky move and <laughs> it happens, right? You know, it's a real demo if uh, things don't quite work right. I love so, it. No, it's proof that we're live. <laughs> so we can do a hipster CICD right here and then uh, I can let you make the choices. So which one would you like to use? Ooh. GitHub Actions. Okay. So GitHub Actions and but then- I do, have, I do have a soft spot for Travis. <laughs> Not, so can, certain, not new, like the best ways. It's like a, like an old ex boyfriend. <laughs> right. It's like a nostalgic. <laughs> yes. Effect, <right>? yes. <laughs> so um, you can see it gives you choices here, right? Space to select or A to toggle all. So you can deploy your application to an artifactory, or you can uh, analyze it with sonar. You can build and publish a Docker image, and you can deploy to Heroku. Right. Those are all included in along with just testing. So by default, this will just run the tests, um, yeah. which we actually have like 80% test coverage on the default app that's generated, um, both in the front end and in the back end. And so that's pretty unique. So um, would you like to choose any of these options? Sonar. Okay. And then any other ones? Uh, definitely deploy to Heroku, if you've got one. Okay. Well, I, I don't know that I'm actually going to demo. I'm, I'm just going to look at the code that's generated. <laughs> so we'll do that. And then uh, Sonar Server. So if your company had their own Sonar Server set up, you could do that. Or if you know you want to use Sonar Cloud, um, that's the default. Um, this is where things might break down. Um, we'll just try. And name of our Heroku application, we'll say uh, jhipster6. Uh, so it created those two files, and if we were to look at, you know, the uh, GitHub workflows, you can see all the code it generates, right? So it's going to uh, just call it jhipster pipeline. It's going to run on push and pull request. And then this line right here is just to allow um, skipping, right, running the yeah. CI process. So if you have a commit that has CI skip in it or all these different variations and it won't do it, I always end up putting the dash in there, so this would actually not catch that. I would have to, you know, refactor that. But then, you know, it has Node in there. It's got uh, some Spring stuff. You know, turn off the SQL because we don't want to clutter up the logs, right? And then it just uses Actions to check it out to set up Node, and then uh, set up Java, install everything because it's got the front end and that's you know npm install, and then the back end just uses Maven. In this case, it could use Gradle. And then it runs all the front end tests with the npm run test. And then you have to set up these GitHub tokens right in your GitHub org. And then, uh, you know, it'll run all the tests for the back end or it'll package it and deploy it to Heroku. So that's all generated for you. And, and I believe those options are going to be there for the other CI CD processes as well. That's pretty awesome. So um, it really can be for almost any scripting, it doesn't just have to be code, right? Right, and there's, uh, for instance, uh, another one is uh, Docker Compose, right? So if you were to use jhipster docker compose, it would create the Docker files for you. So it would say, you know, what type of application would you like to deploy? It'd say monolith. Um, usually you do this in a different directory. So rather than in your same directory, you do like a take Docker, and then you'd run it. And it'll say um, what type, where is it located, right? We put it in jhipster. I think so. What type of application would you like to deploy? A non-monolithic application would be right. my Well, answer. that's a microservices. So I don't know why you would use Docker Compose for a simple, like, monolith, right? Like, sure, mm -hmm. if you had a Postgres database and maybe a Keycloak, you didn't want to use Okta, like, it would start up all of those. So that does work nicely in getting everything to work together. Elasticsearch might be in there. But really, microservices is where that's really going to come in handy. So. If we were to do a new like jhipster ms for microservices and run jhipster, the command is JDL now, and we point to that downloads JDL, jhipster JDL that we had, it'll actually generate everything for you, or I need to update the JDL. So yeah, master branch again, darn it, main branch. There's a lot of moving parts to every step that you, is this like a, like a so this wizard, for lack of a better, term that asks you all these questions. 
Is there a place that you, is that just, I mean, this is an open source project, right? Is this, so yep. that's the blueprint that's asking those questions? Well, that's the main generator. So the blueprints can override those questions, right? They might suppress them and be like, hey, uh, for Micronaut, for instance, it doesn't have microservices support. At least the last time I used it, it didn't. So you'd never see that option to create a microservice application, right? So in the API that we use, it can override those choices. Mm. And so what I'm doing right now is I'm just reverting to the latest release version because I figure that'll work <laughs> instead of the, the main branch there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's so many moving parts. How old is this project? How long have you worked on it? Uh, like six years. Because clearly there's a lot of thought uh, that has gone into this. Well, and a lot of contributors, right, have done a lot of the hard work. I mean, if you look at, so how Yeoman works is it creates a yoRC.json file that stores all the settings in there. So you can basically uh, see all your choices here, right? Like we created a monolith originally. Um, we're using this jhipster version, even though it's the version seven, but you know, we're not skipping any client or server. It's got a whole bunch of stuff in here. And what you can do is you can generate your app and then you can go in here and tweak these, right? You can say, actually, I don't want to use a lot too. I want to use JWT and you change it and you regenerate your app and now you have the new code. So that's one way of kind of playing around with things. Okay, so I think I asked this before, but is there a way to run this like with a NuGet package? Or I, I don't know how much you've ever used NuGet, but it's very popular, at least in the Microsoft world. So I thought I would ask. Um, well, that's it would only be for the .NET Blueprint, right? Mm -hmm. So Blueprint jhipster. Um, let's see if they've had any releases. So they do have releases. Where would I go to find if there's a NuGet package? So like a site? Yeah, it probably would be linked here if it, if it was if it was deployed there. I just thought I would ask the question because so that means that um, you'd have to make sure that you installed NPM. Although if oh, I'm sure that a lot of people in the C sharp and F sharp world also have to sometimes touch JavaScript stuff. And that's why we would have to install NPM. Uh, that's just good to know that that's just like the preferred method because you, it, most of this is command line that I'm seeing. And however, you did say that the, the website though, you can, so how does it work? If you don't want to install NPM in order to get all of that stuff going, it, it'll just do it I guess in a cloud somewhere on that website and then do you download the whole project? Is that how it works? Well, it'll push the code to like, I think GitLab or GitHub based oh, on that's which one cool. you're to. And then, but you still gotta like take it from there and build it somehow, right? So if you were to use Heroku, um, Heroku has the ability to say, here's my GitHub repo, like pull from it and deploy, mm -hmm. right? So you oh, can do that, yeah. but there still has to be a build process that happens somewhere to to basically build your front end and your back end. I think that that's really powerful though, because let's pretend that you are working somewhere that has really bad internet um, or a certain part of the world. And all you've got is like one of those Chrome books that are like 300 bucks or less. And right. you don't want to pull things down and compile it locally. Um, is that even possible? Well, it is, I guess, if it's hooked up to the right um, like CICD process and it's hitting the correct host provider, right, that can go ahead and do all that for you. The difference is you wouldn't be live debugging, but you would see the result. Right. Yep. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I'm starting to try to do like a whole series of things where I just use a compiler in the browser, um, which is something that um, Microsoft's been messing around with for several years, and so they're getting better at it. Um, but with the size of, of what Chrome is, I mean, do you really want to be running something like that in that browser? <laughs> In the, in the JavaScript space, we've we've definitely seen a move to more server side rendered, um, mm -hmm. because for the last what ten years we've been doing it all client side rendered, right? And it works okay because it reduces that load on the server. But I don't know if you remember this, like in the mid two thousands, right? We're always doing server side rendered pages, MVC, and stuff like that, and they snapped, right? They were quick, and like I think with a lot of the Angular and React, like. You're clicking on a link and you're waiting for a spinner. Yes, yes. The next page, right? that, and, so, and that's the reason why there's two different blazers. Like one of them basically just already compiles like and sends just the diff through a web socket to the browser. So everything's already rendered over here and then pushes it. So it's flat and it's very fast. 
Um, it looks like my friend Brian Demers found the NuGet package link. So I'm going to show that for everybody. So I guess it is up there for .NET Core, which uh, the .NET world rejoices because <laughs> it's that's the first place we look for anything. Is, is but, it a, and that should be how it is, right? For Maven, it's the same way, or for any Java, like mm -hmm. you should be able to get it, you know, using Java tools. And uh, we don't actually require you do an npm install. Um, mm -hmm. If you were just to create a project, um, there is a flag where you can say don't install, and so you wouldn't need like npm. It would actually um, do the build process for Maven or Gradle or whatever build tool you use. Those are the only two we support, though. So. So it actually, it, I think most of them, most of the blueprints try to do the same thing, which is you only need to have your core language installed. You don't really need, you know, JavaScript. Like we will download a plugin to build your JavaScript and act like NPM for you. That's how it, I mean, the less I can put on my machine, the better, right? Um, I get really spoiled because, you know, I built an entire PC here that is a beast and can run VR. But there's lots of people who can't, and so it's good to know that there are options for it. Yeah, and especially when you get into Docker, like uh, the, the default Docker configuration, if I tried to run this microservice architecture that I'm building right now, like... <laughs> I think it takes like 15, 16 minutes to start or something like that. But if you tweak Docker to give it like 10 megs of RAM or 10 gigs of RAM, then it starts really fast, right? So it's one of those things that um, microservices I think are great. Um, but if you have to run everything on your local machine, like <laughs> it's a good excuse to get a fast machine, I guess. But otherwise it's nice to just run one service and have the other ones like running in a development environment somewhere. So, okay, I've noticed a couple of things way earlier in this process, and I'm sorry this is an out of turn question. You mentioned reactive as a yes or no. And is, is that something that matters with every language that is available with JHipster or not? Yeah, it's pretty much like does a language or framework support it? A lot of times, rather than talking about languages, we talk about frameworks, right? Because in Java, we have two or three, four big ones. You know, there's uh, there's like microprofile or what used to be Java EE, now it's Jakarta EE. And someone did actually write a blueprint for that. I just discovered it a few weeks ago. Um, there's also Quarkus, which implements microprofile, but still Java. And they have reactive support. Um, Micronaut, I think, same way. Um, but in the core, Spring Boot has Spring Webflux, which is an alternative to Spring MVC that does all the reactive stuff. So it's a way different programming model because you're basically streaming data the whole time. You're not blocking ever. And so it kind of depends on the language or framework, whether it's supported. Like there's a good chance it's supported in a language and a framework, but has anyone taken the time to do that in a J-Hipster blueprint? Like that's a lot of work, you know? No, that makes sense. So. If I wanted to get involved, which again, this is the first time I'm seeing this, or if anybody else is watching wants to get involved. So like, how do you even start? Cause it's a lot of different options. And is there like a list of things that desperately need to be done more than like creating a brand new framework integration? I think the best thing is to go to like uh, just the main J hipster um, right here, right? This is our main J hipster org. So you can see there's a few highlighted uh, projects here. Generator J Hipster, that's the main one. So if you found a simple bug when you're just generating a regular app, that's where you might look. jhipster.github.io is our jhipster.tech website. And so what I've found is like documentation can be like one of the best ways to get started in contributing to open source. Like try to develop an application with it, you know, just a simple one maybe. And if you stumble anywhere, like go fix the docs to, you know, make that better. So for instance, um, if we were to go to jhipster here, or jhipster.tech, and we were to go to the here side, and you know jhipster in a few minutes, and uh, contributing, right? It's got a contributing guide. Doesn't tell you much. Maybe this one. So this is you know how you do it. So um, you know. This is a jhipster bug tracker. We have issues and bugs and feature requests. So um, one of the things I would do is go and look at like open issues. Mm. Right? But some of these are like, you know, login redirect doesn't work in OAuth 2 and React. And we have a bug bounty on that. Um, but I went and tried to reproduce it this morning. And at first I was like, no, nah, this works fine. And then after some further investigation, the person didn't report that logging with OAuth 2 doesn't work. 
they reported that if you go to a protected URL in your browser, then it doesn't actually redirect you back to like the login page, right? And so I think some of these, um, what we should probably do is we need like a, a good for beginner kind of tag, right? So you could you could filter by that. Um, but let's say .NET, right? You're interested in .NET, so .NET Blueprint J Hipster. Let's go look and see if there's any issues there. So there's 32 open issues. There's documentation, right? Adding auditing documentation. There's uh, changing it to use Cypress. Improved documentation. Um, there's adding that uh, ability to deploy to Heroku. Right, and so from here, what I would say is if you find something that's interesting, I would almost uh, comment on it, right? Or reach out to the project or whoever entered the issue and be like, how can I how can I do this? This person here, Nicholas 63, I think he's one of the main developers on the uh, the blueprint. So it'd be a question of, you know, can we, uh, can we talk to him and get some guidance? But a lot of times what I've found is um, just contributing to open source, it's the willingness to try and uh, and then finding like almost a mentor to help you contribute, you know, because it's really about like if you wanted to contribute to this one, you would fork the repo repository, clone it locally, and then fix something and create a pull request and hope all the tests pass, right? If we were to look at some of the existing ones for this, you can see, you know, this is just uh, updating what we call a needle and a needle allows you to inject behavior into these templates. And so um, you can see they only changed one line of code, right? To just change that simple thing, um, but all the tests pass. And so then there's some discussion here. That's pretty cool. There's, there is a lot of options where, I mean, has the community talked about where it's naturally just kind of growing towards? Is there like a next, like, I don't know, um, but like the next use for JHipster besides uh, obviously having more and more blueprints for what it already does? Right, I think it's, uh, I mean, we've actually made an effort. So we're working on version seven right now and we hope that that's out by the end of the year, at least a beta version, um, because we released version six in June of 2019. Right, so we're going on almost a year and a half, and you know, you'd think maybe we had more time in 2020 because we're at home, but there's, uh, you know, everyone like it wasn't easy just because we we're at home to work more, right? And so, uh, and so there's there's been a delay, but it's because we're trying to do um, a lot of refactorings to make it easier to maintain and also dropping stuff. So I think uh, you know what I've learned in my career is uh, is you can have so many options, but you don't really want to be overwhelmed with the options. You don't want the paradox of choice. So for me and Jay Hipster, I focus on like monoliths, microservices, Java and Kotlin, right? There's a Kotlin blueprint that I like to use. Um, but as far as like .NET Core, like I'd like to support it. I go and put bump bounties on it, but I don't see myself using it. If, if you or right. someone else on their team wanted to use it, I would certainly help you with that, right? But I'd be learning at the same time. And so I think, uh, you know, trying to narrow your options Right, is almost a good thing. Like I've learned that if I use Elasticsearch um, in a lot of my demos, they fail, so I stopped using it. It's nothing against Elasticsearch. It's just our support of it isn't like up to snuff all the time. Well, but that's like the beauty of open source, right? It's the it's the Wikipedia kind of option. It's crowdsourced, and right. so it's it's not super perfect, but. I, you, I see in here you have some sort of integrated tests. Is there a place where the tests live in this uh, repo? Like, can you add tests? Is there like is right? It so they probably use like uh, GitHub Actions, right? Mm -hmm. So if you were to go to GitHub and look at their workflows, then you could see, you know, for the main generator, you know, it just runs like npm ci and npm test, right? So then, if you want to write tests, you would do that in the appropriate directory, and so that would test like. Uh, you know, these are testing different things, right? So all the different app types, JWT with Angular, with Blazor, MSQL, MySQL, and then it has parameterization for how to do that. And then all these scripts like run it, right? And so there's there's actually one guy, Pascal, and now he's a lead, um, one of the leads on JHipster. The other two folks that are leading with him were uh, Juli uh, Julian and then uh, and Deepu, and both of those folks did a tremendous amount of work 
But what Pascal originally got into is just CICD, right, of the project and making sure things worked. And now he's like a lead. So I think it's important to specialize, right? If you are going to contribute to J Hipster, you know, whether it's Blazor or Angular or React or something like that, like I specialize in OAuth, right? And so um, every once in a while, like we added the reactive support, I had to go in and figure out how to do a reactive gateway with Spring Cloud Gateway and make that work with OAuth, right? And so um, a lot of that is just trying to narrowly focus so you aren't overwhelmed with all the work, right? If you're if you're tracking all the tickets and trying to fix everything, you're just going to burn yourself out. I so have that's been what. there many times. Yes. Do you have data around like the use? I mean, obviously inside of GitHub, I think you can have a little bit. Is that mostly where you know you could get some of your insights? Yeah, so you can look at some things here, right? Insights. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what they give us here. Um, this is just on usage, right? Like how much people are working. Mm -hmm. Um, this is only for a week, so if we were to go to a month, I mean, there's there's a lot of commits going on, right? There's a lot of work being done, but I think what's more interesting is if we go to start jhipster.tech, these should be um, jhipster statistics. These should be anonymous so anyone can see them. And so you can see this is just the last 24 hours, right? There's been 538,000 projects generated. That doesn't sound right. Well, I think this is this is overall right. Mm -hmm. um, but yes. the last month, you can see like on particular days, there's seventeen hundred projects generated on the, you know, eleven eight. Um, last year, there's twenty five thousand. Is that just month. based on the web version? Yeah. So it has nothing. Not not the one that you install on npm. Well, here's what it says. So. Um, I think it prompts you when you first install jhipster and you first run it if you want to share your stats. And so for all our CD and CI processes, we make sure and turn that off. All right, we don't th want those to influence stats, but like I haven't been prompted to share um, my statistics with jhipster like in the last year. But I think what I'd have to do is completely uninstall it, reinstall it, run the command, and then it would prompt me. So it's mm -hmm. like a one-time thing. But you can see, like, what about Angular versus React, right? That's kind of interesting. Um, in the last 24 hours, someone went big on Angular there. Um, not as many React, but I think a lot of it also has to do with our defaults, right? The default choices, right? So you can run jhipster and just hold down your enter key, and it'll select all the defaults, right? And you don't have to make all those choices if you want. So I imagine some people might do that. Um, there's other interesting things like, you know, Maven versus Gradle. Again, a lot of people choose Maven, but I don't know that they did it consciously. I think they were just like, yeah, it's a default, I'll use it. Yes. I mean, I'm not knocking defaults, but it, it, the whole purpose of this is to just like uh, dig a little deeper as to what you need, right? Right. I remember being told at one point in time that Angular is dead, and I laughed. <laughs> no, it's funny because, I mean, I think in the general web community, Right, it mm -hmm. it might be a little bit, but it's only for the bleeding edge folks, right? And uh, and the Java community, like we're pretty leading edge in the Java space, but we're not that leading edge in the web framework space, especially for JavaScript. So um, we might be like two years behind. And what I found is a ton of Java developers really like Angular because Angular JS was one of the first ones that was like, put your controllers here, put your services here. You know, put other things here, and we were kind of used to that in Java land, and mm -hmm. so people really embraced it. And I think um, people have learned React and they liked it, but there's still, like you said, a nostalgic feeling for Angular. Yes, uh, there's a good mention here. Uh, it looks like statistics can be shared through the CLI, but a lot of people don't see statistics, especially if they're under a company proxy configuration. That's interesting. Cool. And yeah, I went ahead and put up the link to the, the stats on this because I find personally, I find it really fascinating. Um, data supports what we do, right? And so I actually had no idea how many people use this on a practically daily basis, it looks like. Right, and this is interesting, like, you know, the cloud deployments, right? Like mm -hmm. Kubernetes is a quarter of it. Um, cloud Foundry, it's funny because I have a nostalgia for Cloud Foundry because it's been really easy, but they just announced like 
two or maybe a month ago that they're shutting down in January. And uh, it's funny because Julian Dubois, like, you know, one of the founders of J Hipster has been trying to drop support for it forever. And I'm like the one that's like, no, it works. Right. And so finally we are dropping support because it's not going to be there anymore. Uh, probably one of the easiest ones for me to use was always Jenkins, um, like as a CID CD product. It's really ugly, but it's like the Craigslist of things that just works, you know. Um, but it's definitely not the, the, the like the sexy one, you know, forever. So at one point, it was like the only one that people used for a while. So I understand the nostalgia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I still like it too. Oh yes, yes. So. Of all of the different projects, I don't know, maybe you obviously don't have to, people don't have to show you what they're building, but is there like a particular project that you saw actually ended up like going live that was generated with Jamster? That's going to be a tough one. I wouldn't know where to find that. Let's see. Um, oh, just maybe heard between like the, the contributors that have worked on it. Now we got no shining example, I don't think. None that's like, you know, we don't have a Yahoo of J Hipster or anything. <laughs> I mean, I think one one of the things that's cool is um, you know, with Java developers, a lot of times they do a lot of things behind the firewall, right? It's not as public facing a lot of times as B2B between companies. And if you look down at the bottom here, uh, where is it? My client side options. Uh, who uses J Hipster? So yeah. you can see here we have a list of three hundred and sixteen companies. Right, that's in this all link here, um, but we feature 65 of them. So this is developers that work for these companies and have filled out this form to say, yes, we used it to develop an app. That's pretty cool. Wow. That's not nobody. <laughs> so how many downloads does this have if you just download it through NPM, I guess, right, locally? Well, let's look, so npmjs.com. And then if we look for generator J hipster. Uh, looks like almost 42,000 a week. Oh my gosh. Congratulations on working on such a successful project. Yeah, it's been fun. It's uh, it, it can be, like I said, overwhelming, but you know, Okta has been great in letting me work on it and doing it as part of my day job. Oh, no, for sure. I know for me that now I'm going to definitely mess around with a couple of different things. So these are, you said, these are mostly focused on, you said microservices and monoliths, but you really like mean at the end of the day, like REST APIs. Are you talking about that or just microservices in general? Is that like what this tends to go towards? So it's a good point. Let me uh, just stop sharing my screen if you wouldn't mind, and then we can talk more about this because I think it's an interesting topic. Um, how we do microservices right now is we generate the backends as separate projects, right? And they have REST APIs that the front end talks to. Well, the front end is all generated in gateway. And so if you think about it, the whole purpose of microservices is to make them independently deployable, right? And so you can just deploy this, uh, this store microservice and the backend will be updated. And ideally the front end's updated too, right? But how it works with JHipster is you would have to update the front end on that gateway, and then you would have to deploy two of them. So what we end up is with is a monolith UI. Yeah. So even though we're doing microservices on the back end, we have a monolithic UI. And so we're not doing quite the same service there. So the thing that's excited me for about a year, and it's still not fully baked, is uh, micro front ends. And so what micro front ends allow you to do is put your front end on that microservice or in that same application and then basically pull it in at runtime into your main gateway application. So your gateway would be like a shell, but it might have like user management or something like that that's common to the whole architecture, but then the actual like product pages or you know blog pages or whatever would be sucked in from the other application. So um, Webpack 5 was just released, I think, a couple weeks ago, and they have module federation built in. So this allows you to do um, what we're talking about where in your Webpack build, you configure it to be like, hey, you're going to talk to this remote server to get your data and render it and have like fallback ability and stuff like that. So we've done a great job on the back end of architecting and using microservices for the last like, you know, six or seven years. But the front end still like 
figuring out that, oh, we're not doing it like we should be doing. So that's where micro front ends come into play. And uh, there's issues for J-Hipster. There's bug bounties out there. But we've really been waiting for the frameworks to catch up because uh, React is not so much a framework as like a UI toolkit, right? right? And so it's easy for you to say, hey, Webpack, do this. But Angular is more of a full-featured framework, and people don't even really want to do it without the Angular CLI. And so the Angular CLI, the first time we're going to support it is in JHipster 7, which we're releasing in a month or two. And so, you know, there's been a lot of demand for it, but we've, <laughs> we've been kind of ignoring it. Um, but now, uh, even if you went to the Angular CLI and looked, there's issues for, like, module federation and Webpack 5. And so it's not fully ready yet. Um, but I but think it will be. There. Yeah, yeah. And I think it will be in Angular 11, which is supposed to be released tomorrow. So like, I think there'll be a lot of things happening shortly on the micro front end spot in Data Hipster. And that's that's what I'm excited about. I've been working on the micro uh, services and the React stuff for the last year. And now like the micro front ends might be ready to implement. And that's... So that's now what, I'm fascinated by that. Like I, I told everybody that I was allergic to UIs and that's why I wanted to stick to back end stuff, you know, but it's like, we really can't, it seems like at some point in your career, if you touch code, you're going to have to mess around with a front end something, right? Well, and I think for our jobs, like, <laughs> it's tough to be hip, right? And talking about the latest and greatest, unless it's the latest and greatest, right? Like... <laughs> Well, like uh, I remember last year when they, when WebAssembly like came out, right? And people were talking about that. I'm like, oh, there's just yet another thing I have to pay attention to. Like, is it going to catch on? Is it not going to catch on? Um, the big joke is, um, is this going to be the next silver light or, or not? You know, where it just has its time, brief moment, and it just kind of fizzles out. Or is right. it going to be? Or is it going to be more like? AR and VR, where like it, the initial excitement was there, and then it just kind of went into some like R and D with um, regular companies, and now they are, after about ten years, pushing it now, going, no, it's it's ready for prime time. Let's do it. So if you had invested time back then, you were ahead of the curve, and that's really exciting. Though I, now I have to like search um, how to do some more blueprint stuff for .NET because there's definitely a lot coming here. .NET 5 just got released um, this week. Right. It's very exciting. Finally, we have a unification. Um, and of course, there's all sorts of things coming down in JavaScript world. I know Python has a lot going on <laughs> right now, um, not to mention what's happening in Ruby on Rails as well. So it, it is really exciting, but my goodness, it's a lot of options. So this is really helpful, I think, um, I'm going to try and see if I can, can't can use this maybe for a demo in the future. Because the less things I have to create just the basics of, the better. I would rather focus on my business logic for what I am trying to build and less about just putting the guts together. Um, I used right. to be excited about the guts like when I first learned about the guts of a project. And then after that, it just becomes annoying to constantly have to fill up a JSON file with a bunch of settings. It, it, you know, that's, maybe that's just me. Uh, if anybody uh, out there ever wants to drop us uh, any questions like about JHipster, you can always hit us up on Twitter and ask us. Uh, but also you can email us at devrel.octa.com. And we are happy to forward everything over to Matt so that he can answer the questions about the framework. Um, and of right, course, we're going to. Right? Instead of the SAML ones, they're like, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, and of course, if you want to see this replayed, it will be on our YouTube channel after this. Uh, so definitely subscribe a little bit there. But um, thank you so much for joining me, Matt, and answering all my seemingly pretty silly questions for somebody who's definitely in the trenches, but I'm excited to see how we can automate even more. I mean, maybe like the next time we come on, we can start talking about making it all voice controlled, you know, blueprints. I'm all for that. Let's experiment with that. Right. I've got another funny story that I think it'd be fun to end with. So um, when I first started Okta, um, you know, I, I came up with this mantra that I was going to use J hipster and do a lot of demos with it. And, uh, and what I found was, uh, I think it was at DevOps UK. Um, I was doing like a microservices demo and uh, it took like 10 or 15 minutes to generate everything. And I was like, oh my, this is like, you know, talking my way through it, like showing the code and stuff like that. And, uh, and I experienced like a whole, you know, three or four more months, maybe even a year until I went to a J Hipster conference, J Hipster Conf. And uh, 
was talking to the fellow people that, you know, worked on the project. And I was like, it always takes me like eight, nine minutes to generate a project. And they were like, what? It takes me like 30 seconds. And so we compared machines and I was on an older MacBook or on a newer MacBook Pro than they were. And, uh, and it just generated so much faster. So it turns out Okta installs by default software that scans any new files that you would add. So an NPM install, right, installs like millions of files and it was scanning oh, every one. No. I finally got permission to like just ignore one directory, right? And that's what I generate all my code in. And so I got it down to like 30 seconds. And the reason I bring it up is because in these, you know, COVID and virtual times, what I've noticed is if you're using Camtasia or something to record your screen, you can get similar kinds of major slowdowns, yes. right? So if you're doing any J Hipster screencasts or playing with it, like cut that part out, right? <laughs> or do it off screen or something like that because you know it looks slow, but it's really fast normally when you're developing on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, I feel you there. Like uh, there are definitely times I want to throw my computer out the window because of what's going on, um, especially when you kind of go into a VM inception where you start <laughs> digging into things on top of booting into that, but also going down this rabbit hole and then remoting into another computer from there. Like it, I worked on a lot of uh, major enterprise stuff that still uh, requires you to just only have the credentials to remote into that machine. And then that machine, you need to boot into something different. And then you go from there. And every time that everything just slows and slows and slows. Uh, I still think it's incredible that get, you know, anything that runs on, I don't know, uh, like Azure or anything, any can even remotely be fast enough, um, depending on the connections that they've got going on, what people are doing with the boxes they have up there. I still think it's incredible. We've done a lot with hardware acceleration. Luckily, I don't have to own those pieces of hardware. They can be in a data center somewhere doing that. Uh, um, but I feel, yeah, sometimes it's like the simplest problem causes the most amount of pain. Yep. Yeah. Well, thanks again for joining me. And uh, unless you want to tell people where they can find you on Twitter, that would be awesome. Yeah, I'm at M Rabel, so M R A I B L E. And uh, if you want to share my screen one more time, I have a funny thing that I discovered today. Okay. So there is this tool that allows you to see your Twitter family. And I don't know how it works, but my Twitter family, my parents are Josh Long and uh, Jay Hipster. <laughs> and, um, this is Julian, who uh, you know was one of the co-founders of J Hipster. My children are Octadev and uh, Asa Kali. So uh, <laughs> it's funny because if you go to this site and uh, and you know go ahead and do it, I unchecked this box that said post a tweet with your results, and it still did it. So just to warn you, if you do do that, it might post it even though you never want it to. But I thought it was funny when it did it and somewhat accurate. <laughs> Did you end up tweeting it anyway? Well, that's what I'm saying is I, I never <laughs> tweeted it and it did it anyway. Like I unchecked the box, I said tweet it and boom, it went out there. But I also noticed a bunch of friends did it. So that was kind of fun. They probably unchecked the box too and it just ignores it. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, thanks so much. And I can't wait to do another one of these with you in the future. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. <laughs>